Hi, my name is Brandi Young and I am an integration librarian with InfoHio, Ohio's pre-K through 12 digital library. Today you are seeing the recorded presentation of Make It at Your Library, Building a Maker Community for EBSCO webinar series. I do apologize that you are not able to watch the recording of the live webinar, but there were some technical difficulties with sound, so instead we have a recording of my presentation. Um, a little bit about me before we get started. My background is that I have been a high school English teacher and a theater director, a middle school librarian, and a elementary school librarian. So I have run the gambit of K through 12. And while I was a school librarian, I worked very closely with um, the public libraries in my area. Um, part of my job with Info Ohio is focusing on all things, focusing on all things digital literacy whether that be makerspaces within the academic libraries, public libraries, school libraries, or classroom school setting um, and museum settings. Um, it also focuses on digital citizenship, media literacy, digital literacy, um, technology literacy, information literacy, and really just all things technology integration. Um, I absolutely love technology and spend a lot of time with it for my job and in my personal life. If you'd like to contact me, uh, my information is on the screen, but my email address is b period nicole period young at gmail.com. And you can follow me at twi on Twitter at young underscore librarian. Um, during the webinar, EBSCO was having um, live tweets happening. So if you'd like to take a look at that, you can use the hashtag EBSCO webinar to find all of the live tweets from the webinar um, and some of the things that were said during the actual webinar. So we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So to start out, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a makerspace is. Um, that way, if you are new to the makerspace world, uh, you'll have a good frame of reference. Um, if you are a makerspace veteran, um, then this is old hat to you. So just uh, hang on just a second. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So if you Google the word makerspace, you'll get thousands of different definitions. Um, over the years of working in the makerspace world, uh, these are the terms, um, the definitions that I like the best. They're the ones that I think uh, make the most sense explaining it to um, someone who doesn't know what it is um, or has never heard of a makerspace before. Um, so a makerspace is a hands-on space with tools and resources to encourage patrons or makers to design, experiment, build and invent as they engage in engineering, tinkering, creating, and of course, making. It is a combination of a science lab, a wood shop, a computer lab, and an art room. Um, so if you guys remember back in the day, uh, um, uh, shop class or wood shop class or um, home ec class, which is now called family and consumer science class, um, those are all great examples of what we had um, as makerspaces back then. Um, they just weren't called makerspaces. Uh, the ten, tend and trend of education and library world, I've noticed, um, is that we have the a circle of life when it comes to these different trends. Um, and they come back around. They just come back around with different names. So that is the case of a makerspace for sure. Um, a makerspace is also known as a STEAM lab, which we'll talk about what that means here in a moment, a fab lab, which is short for fabrication laboratory, a hacker space or a creation sp um, station. Um, there are lots of different names for makerspaces other than those, and most libraries um, name their own makerspaces. I would suggest in order to help build community and build a maker community to actually have your patrons help name your makerspace. So whether that's um, a suggestion box or a contest, you know, who doesn't like a little friendly competition, um, what have you, um, have them name it so then they have some uh, even more stake in the space. Simply put, a makerspace is a place where makers, patrons, can envision a product or a project, find an expert, and create or make something. 
So why add the A to STEAM? I'm, or to STEM, I'm sorry. I mentioned STEAM on the previous slide. Um, first, let's take a step back and talk about STEM. Um, if you're not familiar, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And it is a trend in education that's about approximately 8 to 10 years old. Um, it's been fueled by um, STEM education and makerspaces and the idea of we want kids thinking um, collaboratively um, to build a better future um, and build, build a better tomorrow. Um, so then we have STEM and now we have added um, the A um, to STEM to make STEAM. The A stands for art. So anything in the fine arts area. So the, whether that's um, cooking, culinary, um, art, um, as in painting, drawing, um, um, those types of things, your traditional art classes, or uh, music, or dance, or theater. Um, so we're adding the A, the fine arts, to, st to STEM to make STEAM, excuse me. Um, so art adds the more human element to innovation. Um, there's definitely a human element, element to um, science, technology, engineering, and math. But now we want to add um, more of the feeling um, to it. Uh, for the reasons, for many reasons, but definitely because uh, many of today's CEOs and companies are looking to hire people who can not only think critically about um, a problem, but also think creatively about how to solve a problem. So we have um, all of the um, creativeness that, we're, that brings in with the fine arts, um, and we're bringing that to science, technology, engineering, and math too. Um, there's also another movement happening that is adding the H to STEAM, which is H meaning history. Um, so we're truly adding um, all of the elements that you learn about in school. We're having a cross-curricular interdisciplinary um, thing happening, which is really cool to see. Um, so another reason to add the A into STEM to have STEAM is it gives you the opportunity to reach all your patrons, not just um, the technology, science, engineering, and math people, not the people who just like the cold hard facts and want to think just critically, but also the people who like crafting and have hobbies, maybe playing guitar, um, that type of thing. So you're definitely having a well-rounded makerspace and a well-rounded uh, library system um, to provide well-rounded services to your community. So why would you want to have a makerspace in your library? Um, first of all, it would make your library more awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's even possible for some of you because some of you have some pretty awesome libraries. Um, but what does a makerspace do for um, your patrons and their learning? Um, it inspires, a makerspace inspires wonder. It invites curiosity. It encourages playfulness. It celebrates unique solutions. It um, helps to provide an environment where it is okay to fail. So learning from failure, which we'll talk more about here in a moment. Um, it means breaking things as a part of the process, a part of the learning process. And it gives you the power of a team, the power of collaboration, which is so big right now, especially with employers today. Um, everyone wants you to collaborate. No one wants you just in a silo working by yourself anymore. Um, <clears throat> times they are a change for sure. Um, I love that makerspaces um, inspire and invite curiosity, wonder, and playfulness, especially for um, de-stressing times um, that you see in the news all the time that schools are eliminating recess in favor of more um, academic time, which, you know, our, our students need academic time, but they also need that time to play, um, that time to unwind. And we as adults need that time to play and unwind. That's why the adult coloring book trend is so hot right now, um, which also can be a makerspace, just, just as a side note. Um, so let's talk about learning from failure real quick. Uh, <coughs> we don't ever want to set up anyone to fail that doesn't feel it doesn't feel good to fail however um, what we need to teach our students and even adults um, our patrons is that it is okay to fail it is okay to get to the end and not have your light light up at the end of your circuit board um, it's okay for something to not go a hundred percent correct um, it, what you need to be able to do is learn how to handle the situation and learn how to go back 
look at your instructions and look at what you've done, your step-by-step -step guidelines, and see where you might have taken a misstep. Um, and be able to say, hey, it's okay that it didn't work the first time. Let's go back and figure it out and see where we might have um, fallen off the path or taken a misstep. And let's learn from our missteps. Um, and I have to say, if you're able to get the mentality to switch for um, not only yourself, but your patrons, um, it definitely gives you that aha or like what I call light bulb moments. Um, moving on, breaking things is a part of the process. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also call this deconstruction makerspace. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of places, libraries, who um, get donated items, old technology, um, computers, printers, that type of stuff. And they invite their patrons to take it apart to see the inside or the guts of a computer or a printer because most people don't know what that looks like unless you've taken one apart before um, and it's definitely very hands-on it's very kinesthetic it's very cathartic to take something like that apart um, especially if you have a lot of older technology um, eight tracks that type of thing cassette tapes um, vcr tapes um, pull those apart kids don't know what those are and kids don't know what they look like so it's really neat to also provide them with the learning opportunities um, of this is what technology used to like this is this is how we used to watch movies <laughs> and then we used to watch movies on D we watch movies on dvd sometimes now and now we watch them digitally streaming on our computers or netflix or what have you um, so there's also also a great learning opportunity there to show um, the history of that piece of technology. But I will say, once you break it, keep all of the parts. Um, you'll never know when you could use those again. Um, if you have a bunch of old floppy disks, um, there's always a, there's a floppy disk contest every year that um, invites people to create um, different items, different household items out of floppy disks. And you can win uh, monetary prizes, uh, gift cards, which is great. Um, there's also the um, phenomenon of Franken toys, which I liken to the um, spider monster with the doll head from the movie Toy Story, if you've ever seen it. Um, if not, you can Google Franken toys, um, like Frankenstein, but Franken toys. Um, and what it is, is it's taking old um, pieces and parts of broken toys or broken technology and putting them, fusing them together to make something different or something new. Um, so it's, it's pretty neat. So now that we've talked about all the different things a makerspace can inspire and um, innovate within a person, within a human being or a patron, um, let's continue to talk about what makerspace and libraries have in common. Makerspace and libraries are sites of informal learning. Uh, you go in, you check out materials, you do research online. Um, sometimes you have someone guiding you, but it, it's usually completely patron driven um, or student driven, um, which is great um, because then you have personalized learning as well and differentiated learning. So different levels, different scaffolding. Libraries and makerspaces are inherently interdisciplinary spaces. You cover, um, and a makerspace can cover, um, all the curricular areas. So um, reading, English language arts, writing, uh, science, social studies, uh, math, uh, fine arts, those types of things, it all, it's, it all crosses within you um, and within a makerspace. Um, libraries and makerspaces provide equitable access to materials and resources. That's what a, that's what a library does. That's your mission. Um, and the same thing can be said for a makerspace. You uh, a makerspace provides an even level playing field for those who want to come in and make or create something, um, especially if you have an in-house expert. Uh, libraries and makerspaces serve the common goal of building community. So uh, the library, in my opinion, is the heart of the community. And the maker community is also a huge community. So fusing the two together gives you a great maker community within your library community. So there are several different types of makerspaces. And this is in no... Um, way the official titles of all of these. This is just um, Brandy's <laughs> titles for all these different types of makerspaces. We are going to quickly go over um, each one of these um, 
And then here in a moment, we'll go a little bit more in depth. So a maker hour is basically what it sounds like. It is 60 minutes of either a set planned activity or um, what I call a free for all, which we'll talk about here in a moment, um, where it is just an hour long. Um, Some of my library friends um, do maker Mondays. So they do one Monday a month or every Monday in that month um, for a year, for six months, however long you feel comfortable doing it. Um, Some of my other library friends also do Maker, M-A-Y-K-E-R, month or um, M-A-Y-K-E-R Mondays. So they do every Monday in the month of May or every day in the month of May. Um, So again, Maker Hour is a set, um, just hour um, of making. Then there is the program format, which um, all of you are, um, as public librarians, so amazing at. So basically, it is a <coughs> excuse me set time um, every day, every week, every month, however often you want to have it, um, usually running from a half an hour to an hour and a half. I would suggest no longer than two hours. Um, of a planned activity, a planned maker activity, um, or maybe you have your 3D printer out or whatever um, technology you have available and it is a planned hour of designing um, something for the printer. Um, This is most commonly where your expert comes in, um, an invited member of the community or of your library to help train and help teach the maker lesson or activity for that um, time frame. The take and do or take and make, um, I really loved when I was um, a librarian. What you do with that is it is, it's pre-planned activity. So it has in a Ziploc bag, the instructions and all of the materials and resources needed to make that um, makerspace activity, that item. Um, So for instance, maybe you're making a duct tape flower. So you would have everything you needed, the pen, the duct tape, et cetera, and the instructions in that Ziploc bag. And what happens is um, it is um, up to the patron to take it and away from the makerspace and to do it either at home or in another area of the library and make it, take it, do it, take it, make it. Then you have the open format, and that can be done in several different ways. Um, This is where I was talking about the free-for-all. An open format can be literally you open the doors or open your makerspace for X number of hours a day, um, however many days a week you want, and it is a free-for-all. There um, is no set activity. Um, There are just resources and materials there for... um, patrons to go in and make. Um, the other variation of an open format is the same same idea. Um, it is open um, either all the time or for set hours of, the di- of different days of the week, um, but then there are stations. So there might be a duct tape craft station where th- um, four or five different instructions of different duct tape, tape crafts you can make. There might be a robotic station, that type of thing. So it still is open to choice. Um, but it is not a complete free-for-all. Then you have the advisory board format. Um, If you do not have an advisory board already set up, this is probably the hardest one to do. Um, This is the hardest one to do if you do not have an advisory board already set up, um, either of teens, tweens, or adults, um, because it does take a lot of um, extra work on the front end. However, um, if you're interested in this idea or you already have an advisory board within your library, um, it is great because they do a lot of the work for you. Um, Nobody knows um, what interests um, of a certain age group better than that certain age group. So they can help when you're planning your activities. Um, so they, you just ask them what they think are, you know, inter- what activities are interesting to that certain um, age group. Again, whether it's teens, tweens, or adults, or um, ask a lot of the other, ki- um, ask little kids, interview them. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And 
then they help you plan. So you say, okay, I need four different ac maker activities for this month. Let's plan that. Um, they also can help you go through um, the activities and decide or figure out what materials you need. They can help you pull those materials and put everything together ahead of time. And I also really loved having uh, my advisory board or my volunteers um, do inventory of all of my makerspace materials. That way I knew, oh, I'm running low on beads or I'm running low on toilet paper tubes or egg cartons. Now I need to ask for more donations for that type of stuff. So those are the different types of makerspace, um, makerspace plans that you can have. Uh, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail um, here in a moment about each one. However, I will say no matter what type you decide to do, take pictures. Um, create a unique hashtag for your makerspace. Um, for example, uh, one of mine was hashtag wildcats make. And it's great because then you use that on all your social media, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, what have you, and they can use that to search just for the items that are being done in your makerspace, um, which is fantastic because then different community members see that and say, oh, I want to learn how to make that. And then that's driving them back into the library and back into your makerspace, which is fantastic, of course. When it comes to any of these types of makerspaces, you can um, pick and choose, combine some together, um, pull some apart, <laughs> whatever works best for you, your library space, your makerspace, and your patrons. Um, there is no set, um, nothing set in stone that says you have to do it this way either. Um, come up with a way of doing your own. Um, if you come up with something new, be sure to share, of course. Okay, you're like, all right, Brandy, you know, this is great. I'm in. I totally want to do this. You know, I either want to build a makerspace or I already have a makerspace and I'm ready to dive in to um, other realms of making. Awesome. Now what? Okay, great. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> you're going to start with the InfoHio Make It or Maker Kit guide. Um, it is found at this address, libguides.infohio.org forward slash makerspaces. I'm going to quickly go over the InfoHio Make It with you. Um, just so you know, even though InfoHio is Ohio's pre-K through 12 digital library, um, this maker kit is open to anyone, um, no matter what um, area you work in and no matter what state you live in and work in. So it is, it is open to you. On the home page, there is a short little video here that explains um, what a makerspace is, so very similar to what we already talked about. Um, if you scroll down, if you happen to be working and living in Ohio, um, there are the four main content areas, um, English, language, arts, math, science, and social studies. Their standards have been pulled um, from the Ohio learning standards um, that fit with making and makerspaces. Um, so that way, if you need, um, if you want to partner with a school library, or if you're looking at um, ways to justify having a makerspace, um, in Ohio, there's there's some reasons why. If not, um, if you're not in Ohio, you can do something similar. Um, go to your state's um, standards, uh, whether it be your own state's or Common Core, and pull the standards. It's a great it's a great advocacy piece. Now, if you click the tab that says Make It, under that tab, um, there is a um, Twitter feed of what's happening with hashtag makerspace. There's always also a list of makers on Pinterest, a comprehensive list of makers to follow on social media and blogs um, that open in different um, documents. Under the Make It um, tab, there's a drop down menu that says Maker Lessons, Activities, Marketing, Planning, and Advocacy. <coughs> The first thing you should probably start with is the advocacy area if you are just starting a makerspace and you need reasons why to have a makerspace. Um, on the advocacy area, the advocacy phase, there is a Pinterest board, which when you click on will take you to that Pinterest board, and it has um, hundreds of resources of why you should have a makerspace in your library or in your school setting or what have you and what the power of making can do. So again, the creativity, the innovation, the playfulness, um, thinking outside of the box, collaboration, that type of thing. Um, 
So it's a great advocacy piece of, hey, we need a maker makerspace because, okay. So let's say you've got your library director on board. Um, you are ready to go. You are ready to take the next step. Yes, I want to have a makerspace. I've been approved to have a makerspace. Awesome. You're going to want to hit the planning stage next. Now, the planning stage is very much what I talked about, um, the types of formats that you want. Um, so there's a small flowchart here that helps you think about um, different things like, do you have a budget? Um, do you, for a makerspace, yes, no. Um, do you, are you willing to ask for donations? Yes, no, um, that different types of um, thing. Then if you scroll down, you have the makerspace format plans, the student advisory board, if you click the tabs, the open format, the program format, and the take and do. Um, on each one of these tabs, there are Google Docs that open um, that give you questions. So I'll click the open format makerspace plan. And that opens up to um, planning phase, brainstorming phase, um, evaluation phase, different questions for you to ask yourself. So your logistics for your makerspace, where is your space? What does it look like? What storage do you need? When do you hold the maker sessions? Um, you need a list of activities if you're going to have a, um, if you're going to have set activities, then of course you need to ask for donations if you don't have a budget or even if you do have a budget, ask for donations, ideas of who to ask um, for donations from, um, how to advertise, um, different places to advertise um, when your makerspace is open, um, how to research for grants for different equipments your implementation phase and then if you um, want to have an evaluation phase there are ideas of how to evaluate your program as you're going. Um, so again each one of these opens up into a Google Doc that you can um, save or print for later use. If you scroll on down there is another Pinterest board of ideas of makerspace storage. Um, for instance, um, I've had a makerspace on a cart before and because of Pinterest, I thought of putting metal hooks on the end of the cart so I could hang um, buckets and bins and scissors off of the cart, maximizing my storage space. So okay, you have your makerspace, you've got it backed by your director, you know what type of format you want. All right, awesome. Now what you need to do is you need to start, whoops, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong one. There we go. Now you need to start planning your activities. So underneath Maker Lessons and Activities, there is a giant Pinterest board. Can you tell that we love Pinterest <laughs> at InfoHio? And I personally love Pinterest. Um, I love the idea that you, know, you can cur um, curate um, information so easily with Pinterest. Um, so there's a giant Pinterest board of all different types of maker activities um, from the low tech, which is more like crafty hobby type stuff to the super high tech um, 3D printing, that type of stuff. So um, the idea of zero dollars up towards five thousand um, dollars, whatever, you know, you want. OK, so you have your director with you, you have your plan, you have your activities. Now you need to advertise and market. Under the marketing phase, you have a donation recommendation and flyers. So it um, gives you ideas of who to ask for donations, um, a donation recommendation list. So things that you can ask for, um, egg cartons, paper towel, um, tubes, um, Legos, um, tons of Legos sitting in basements, um, broken toys Frank for Franken toys, that type of thing. Um, and it's always being updated and always being added to. Um, so ideas for you. And then this is probably one of my favorite areas, the donation flyer. When you click on the donation flyer, it opens up and it explains very briefly what a makerspace is. Um, and then it goes down and gives specific items that you are asking for. Again, this is a completely editable document. And then at the bottom, it gives your information um, where items can be donated to. So, you know, your information um, at Blah Blah Library. Um, the only thing that InfoHio asks is that if you are going to use any of our flyers um, and it has the InfoHio logo at the bottom to just please keep the logo. Um, other than that, it is a completely editable, do editable document for you. Going back to the marketing area, um, 
again this was uh this some ideas for schools if you um if you have a library um, um, system in a school um, but they can also be taken and made for you so school announcements um, student advisory board school announcements so different things that can be um, added into a newsletter for you or um, on your website again um, so friendly language that's attractive but something that's completely editable for you um, flyers. Um, I have several different flyers here that open up in Canva um, that you can edit to your heart's content. They're already designed for you and then you just edit and put in your own information. Um, so there you go. Come make. Um, Stony Brook Library presents want to learn how to make misfit toys. Um, here's when. Um, that type of stuff. So it's already made for you. You can um, here we go, repurpose your old items, um, that type of stuff. So you can take it and print it um, and hang it in your library um, or around the community. Um, same thing with donation flyers, hang those everywhere. Um, and then of course you're going to um, want to also put them on any type of social media that you can. Um, I have actually found that the best place to advertise for things is in public restrooms um, at community centers and your library and city hall, the place, you know, the type of place where people are going to be the most. Um, because what else do you have to do while you're in the restroom? <laughs> you can read flyers on the back of stall doors. So you have everything you need in this kit ready to go. Um, I will say the last thing that is on this is you can become an eye maker. And what that is, is it's um, an eye maker is an InfoHio maker. You're a librarian and you want a makerspace in your library, but you need some help. Um, or maybe you already have a makerspace in your library and you need some help. Um, what we do is um, it's a Google group. Um, you can email me to become a part of the Google group and it's librarians from all over the nation. Um, it's a discussion board set up where you can ask questions. I post um, grants on there. I post um, publication information. I post ideas, um, that type of stuff. Um, so it's all there for the taking for you. Um, one thing I wanted to show you before we go back to and finish up our presentation, if you're looking for another good place to think of um, activities, there's a website called Instructables. So it's instruct, um, a -B -L -E -S com, and it essentially is Google for makerspaces. So you can search anything you want. And so we're just gonna click on laser cutting because it happened to come up. Um, so there are classes here that you can watch videos of, or you can um, search for an activity like a duct tape rose, and it'll come up with different ways to do that. So then what you do is you click on that, and it gives you instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to make a duct tape rose with pictures. Now, um, this is the free version of Instructables. Um, if you want a to pay um, for an Instructables account, you can get a downloaded PDF document without all of the ads and whatnot. Um, but um, I have found a way around that. There is a, a Google Chrome app called Clearly. Um, and another Google <coughs> Chrome app called Readability, and they take ads away from the page. Um, so there's a free way uh, to do that and get around that. So just some things to remember about um, creating a makerspace. Um, you want to start small. Always start small if you don't have one a makerspace already. Start with free start with donated items, start with low-tech crafts, and then you're going to want to build upon your empire, your makerspace. Um, add um, middle grade, middle cost um, technology like Makey Makeys or Little Bits, Arduino kits, that type of stuff, um, or Ozbots, and then um, things that run within the 50 to a couple hundred dollar range, and then build upon that um, 3D printing, um, Cricut machines, um, which are, um, they um, are cutter, cutting machines, uh, vinyl cutters, things that range from, you know, $500 to a couple thousand dollars types of things. So just keep building. 
um, just like you want to keep building your community of makers. Um, if you build it and you advertise it, they will come. Um, word of mouth is a great thing. Again, using social media um, is also a great way to get people in. Um, spark the interest. Um, put little teasers up. Um, maybe show pictures of you setting up for your next maker activity in, um, on um, social media and say, you know, guess what we're going to make on Monday. You know, co come learn how to, you know, come find out on Monday from three to four or whatever um, that you have. Um, it's all about the enticement and getting people in. Once you have people in, you can work on building your community of makers and your community of experts. Um, if you want to have an expert come in, d no matter what type of format you have for your maker space, um, whether it's a program format or what have you, um, have an expert come in. And uh, the way you get experts to come in is you, you listen and you learn about your patrons and you learn about your staff members and their families. Um, my dad happens to know how to weld and he is a CNC um, programmer. So um, I could pull from that to have him help me teach different makerspace items. Um, different people in your community that are involved in manufacturing and construction and art and um, building instruments, um, playing instruments, that type of thing. So get to know your community, get to know the people that are there. Um, your community or a nearby community may already have a makerspace area. Um, in Columbus, we have the Columbus Idea Foundry, which is a, gi a gigantic warehouse uh, makerspace, essentially. Um, so do some research. Um, that's what we do as librarians, of course, um, and find out who the experts are around you. Um, you do not have to be the expert in everything. Um, there's, that's not possible. Um, but as librarians, we are always, uh, we always tell our patrons, um, our customers, that if we don't know the answer, we will find it for them. So if you're not the expert, find an expert for them. Um, a lot of libraries have 3D printers that unfortunately go unused because um, their librarians don't have time to teach themselves. Don't teach yourself, well, teach yourself eventually if you have the time, but find someone that knows how to use it already and knows how to use um, the program to design. Um, it may not be an adult, it may be a kid, it may be a teenager. Um, don't count them out because they are experts. Um, my nephew could school anyone on Minecraft at the age of two. Um, so putting them in the position of power, putting them in the power or position of teacher, of educator during these maker sessions um, is a great thing and gives them confidence um, and boosts their um, confidence and their morale and of course then their stake in the maker space. Um, and it's, it's just great to see the community come together to surround that person. Um, ways to make them feel even more special, of course, um, handwritten thank you notes once they're done. If you can afford a little token of appreciation, chocolate and food always works great, of course. Um, but also before the maker activity, have a spotlight on that person, spotlight in the community. Um, see if you can get that in the paper and then briefly mention your maker activity, but you know, interview them. Um, that was one of the questions in the live session of how do you know that the person isn't going to um, be boring during the presentation. Um, interview them. Come up with a few questions, basic questions of how long have you been in this field? Um, you know, how long have you been doing this as your craft or your hobby type of thing? Um, what would be your plan to train or educate um, adults, teens, tweens, children on whatever the topic is, you know, make them go through the plan with you. Um, and just in conversation, their passion about the subject should come out. And if it does, then you know, you've got the right person on hand. Um, so again, you build it, advertise it, they will come, they will use it. Um, everyone is a baker. Um, have fun. Um, know that we all make mistakes. Um, learning, um, learning from failing is okay. We create, we ask questions, we invent, we're connected. Um, and don't forget, turn to your community and ask for help when needed, especially for donations. Um, I thank you for your time today. Um, and if you have any questions again, uh, feel free to email me um, or find me on Twitter. I thank you very much. Have a great day.